Uh, our next speaker is Matt Wynn talking about hexagonal rails. Morning. I just need to point out, first of all, that I'm not David Chelimsky, despite what it says on your program. So I'm Matt. You might know me from the Cucumber book. That's not actually what I'm here to talk about today. I'm here to talk about a project I've been working on, which is sort of an offshoot from Cucumber. Um, I'm trying to bootstrap a little product which you might have seen, it hosts RSpecs uh, documentation. It's called Relish. And it's a Rails app. And this talk is really all about my experiences trying to make Relish into a, what I would feel would be a habitable Rails application, so a Rails application that I'd like to carry on working on. So the first thing I need to qualify this talk with is just because I'm up here on stage talking to you doesn't make me, at least in my eyes, any kind of an authority. So some of the ideas I'm going to talk about, I'm still just tentatively grasping at them. Right? I'm not here with some prepackaged solution for you. I'm here with some ideas that I want to share to be part of this conversation that I'm really excited about that's going on in the Rails community at the moment about how do we learn from other communities about how they do object-oriented programming and really bring some of those good ideas into, into our world. So I'm exploring that a lot, and I'm sharing these ideas with you, but I'm, I'm really interested in your feedback. So I guess we can do that on the yacht, right? So this is where it starts, isn't it? When you... When you knew up a, a, a brand new Greenfield Rails application, it's really exciting. I love it. I still love it. I've been doing it for years now. It feels so good. And those early days on a project, it's just really fast. You're adding features. It's, it's almost so fast, it's fun. It's like you would pay to do it almost. It's so easy. It's wonderful. And then I keep experiencing the same thing. So I, I hit this point with Relish where I just started to feel like I didn't really want to add any more features to it. I was just reluctant to go in and carry on working on it. So you know my test suite? seemed to take quite a long time to run to give me feedback about whether I'd broken anything. And every time I made a change to any bit of it, I felt like I needed to run all of the tests, just in case. Because I couldn't really tell, you know, which part of the system I might have broken. It all felt really coupled together. And I started to think about, why is that? Because why, why, do, why have I had this consistent experience working on Rails applications? Is it just me? Am I just a bit poor at my job? But I talk to other people, and other people seem to share the same experience. So I went off down a little rabbit hole for a while, trying to figure out what else I could do. And I came across this blog post written about three years ago by Sir Kent Beck, which is... Uh, it was a time he was using an unfortunately named uh, title of responsive design to talk about architecture and design and how it's affected by the business context. So he was trying to build a startup at the time, J Unit Max, and he was really interested in how the, the timing of the business, what stage the business is at, was affecting how he was designing his code. So he talks about two different styles of architecture, okay? A connected style and a modular style. And he talks about the cost of working with those two styles of architecture depending on the stage of your project. And he has this pretty graph. 
So the idea is that early on in a project, a connected style where everything is available everywhere, global state, you can get your hands on anything, is an advantage. Because when you're adding those first few features, everything's to hand, you can reach for it. But eventually, as you add enough features and your product matures, it starts to become a problem. And I think that point where those two lines cross, that's the point where I, I get that sense, like, I just don't want to work on this application anymore. So the question then becomes, for me, how do we move to a modular architecture? What does a modular design for a Rails application look like? So again, I started casting around for ideas, and I came back to this book, which I read quite a few years ago when they were first uh, writing it, and it was free. And I came back and reread this book, and this is an, a, a great book on software design, but the examples are in Java. So it's quite a heavy read. But it was really a revelation for me, and there's two main aspects I want to talk about, about how this book has help me to understand what it means to, to write modular code. So the, the first part I want to talk about is at the high level. And that's where this name hexagonal comes from. So Alistair Coburn, many, many years ago, uh, wrote a, this article about a hexagonal architecture. There's another name for it which he calls ports and adapters. Does anybody here know the adapter pattern from the good old Gang of Four book? Yeah, lots of us. So the, an adapter is a pattern, it's a name that we give to a piece of code which is responsible for translating between one foreign domain and another domain. It's a map. And the idea of the hexagonal architecture is, it's not, it's not, it sounds much more complicated than it is, is that we keep the code that's special about our application, the business logic that makes our application different to everybody else's, we keep that in a, in, a, in a core, what we might call an inner hexagon. We keep it somewhere pure. So there's no dependencies on other libraries, frameworks, and there's no language in there that relates to connecting this thing to the real world. So technical infrastructure like databases, message queues, web front ends, all of that stuff is plugged in to the core domain. So the core domain is pure, just contains what's interesting about our application, and we plug in these adapters that enable it to appear in the, in the real world. So if you think about an idiomatic Rails application, there isn't really an inner hexagon, is there? Right? We go straight from the web adapter, the controllers, and we talk straight to the database adapter, those active record-based subclasses. They're just connected straight together. And again, in the early days on a project, that is an advantage. It's good, because we can knock up features and play around with ideas really quickly. But after a while, it starts to slow us down. And if we don't see that what we're doing is plastering our domain logic to the outsides of the hexagon, we're putting our domain logic smacked up against the database adapter or against the web adapter, and it's, 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 it's getting lost. So we want to try and peel it away and put it somewhere special. So this is like what, uh, if you've watched Gary Bernhardt's screencasts, he puts the stuff that I would call the core, core domain, he puts that in his lib directory. Right, the stuff that's interesting about your domain. Where we get lost here is we're not, we have to start modeling our own domain now. So we can't just come up with another layer. We can't just put another folder in the app folder, like, you know, um, presenters or whatever. We have to actually start modeling our domain. We have to think about our domain. So we have to ask ourselves, what does my application do? So if I take Relish, what does Relish do? Well, we have users, and users have memberships of publishers like RSpec, and then publishers have projects like RSpec Core, and then those projects have different topics, pages of documentation. Oh, now that's not what it does. That's the data. 
And that's the mistake we keep making when we're doing domain modeling. And that's what I've come to realize as I've read the, the Goose book, Growing Object-Oriented Software, is that we get mixed up between modeling around data and modeling around behavior. And I'm going to come back to this. But to help me to understand how I could start to build a model that was richer than just the data that was being um, stored in my application, I had to reach back in time to this age-old extreme programming practice of the metaphor. Anybody remember that? Like two hands. This is one of the most beautiful practices in XP. You have to try and imagine if you built your software system but didn't build it in software, right? If you just built it in, a, in the real world, what would it be? And this is such a great way for starting to tell stories about your domain and explore it. So in my domain, I started to think about Relish. It's like a library. Okay, you come into the library because you want some documentation. Except some of parts of the library are secure, so there's a bouncer who sits in the way and says, oh, no, you can't come in. What's your password? So that's, that me having that metaphor helped me to start to understand how I could build my own domain model. So I've got these active record-based subclasses that are still talking to the database, and I've got my controllers that are coming in, but now I've got some domain models of my own that are starting to take charge, and they become magnets where that business logic can migrate to. So that's modular in the large. What about in the small? So there's another whole side to this, which this is the bit that really freaked me out, actually, as I read Goose and tried to understand about how it related to the programs I was writing in my Rails apps. Because the thing they make really clear in this book is how important the protocols are between the objects. So coming back to this book again. This is what Steve and Nat say. Your domain model, it's not in the classes that you've defined, your projects with uh, topics and owned by publishers. That's not your domain model. The domain model is in the way those objects communicate with each other at runtime. That freaked me out to read that. So let's go back to 1989. And Rebecca Wirth's Brock writes this paper, Object-Oriented Design, a Responsibility-Driven Approach. And she compares 1989. This is a small talker. And this is part of this wonderful small talk community that there was at the time, where all these great people like Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham came out of. These people were really thinking about designing programs. And she identified that there were two different styles of designing object-oriented programs. You could design your programs based around the data and the things that you saw that contained data. Or you could design your object structures around the responsibilities of the things that they had to do. And this is the first, you know, we've got all these DDs now, domain-driven design, TDD, BDD. This is the first one, apparently, responsibility-driven design. And they did this experiment, or actually some students of her did this experiment. So at Boeing, they got two classes, and they taught one class data-driven design, and they taught one class responsibility-driven design, and then they got them to design an object model for a simple program. And they compared the, the quality of the two programs with some metrics. This is just one of the metrics. They ran the object model through a bunch of different scenarios, and they counted how many messages were going back and forth between the objects. And you can see that in every single case, and sometimes dramatically like double, the data-driven design had so much more chit-chat going on. The protocols were much noisier, much busier, much more complicated, much more scope for bugs. So I'm trying to get my head around this. And the way I've been thinking about it is 
If you imagine your, so we're, you know, if you're building a Rails application, we're building uh, a, a web application, and what you're generally doing is you're pulling data out of a database and displaying it on the web. So you think about the, the job of this application that you're building. You think about it like if it was a, a, an assembly line, right? And the first thing you do if you're going to try and model this assembly line is you look at it and go, oh, well, this assembly line makes trucks, right? So we need to have a truck class, and it has many wheels, and you know, it has an engine. But what about the machinery that makes these trucks, right? Because actually, the trucks are just kind of dumb values that are getting put together by this assembly line. What about all the tools that the people on the assembly line use? to make the trucks, to test the trucks and check whether they need to change something about them. Because that's actually the stuff that our web application does. That's the interesting stuff that we do, the behavior. So trying to start thinking about protocols between objects. And there's a great talk from, uh, I think, last year's RubyConf by Greg Meek which is also inspired by the Goose book. He talks a lot about how, um, how testing can help you to design protocols. I'm not going to talk about that. But I'm going to talk about one specific thing, which is this principle which our good friends, the pragmatic programmers, coined as tell, don't ask. Everybody heard of that? How many of you think you'd do it? Because I sort of thought I did it. Right? And then I read Goose, and I realized I was nowhere near. And I can almost guarantee that you have a problem with procedural code in your Rails controllers. I can almost guarantee it. It's everywhere. And again, in the early days of a project, I think it's fine. It gets us up and running. It gets us places. But for maintainability in the long run, it sucks. And don't kid yourself that you're writing an object-oriented program. So I'm going to try and give you an example of what I mean. Because there's so many places you can apply these ideas. And I started out on the boundary between the controller and the domain model. And seeing if I could get a tell, don't ask style working, where I wasn't asking any questions of objects. I was telling other objects to do things. So I'm going to try and take you through an example. And I'm kind of calling this pattern a passive controller. So rather than the controller, when, the, when Rails hits the action, rather than the controller then, t then kind of orchestrating a bunch of things happening on the domain model, all the controller does is it sends a message to the domain and then waits to hear what it should do. OK? So I'm going to give you an example. So this is a, I, I, I'm skeptical if you can see it at the back. Can I get some feedback? Is it OK? Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't make it any bigger. This is the uh, organizations controller from Relish. It's a fairly typical controller. Look at the create action. So we, we create a new organization object with some parameters. We set a field on it, and then we try and save it. And we check whether the save succeeded. If it did, we do something else to the object, and then we redirect off to another page. It's fairly sort of classic Rails code, yeah? I wrote it. Don't, you know, I'm not ashamed of it. But what, what I could criticize about this is we're mixing up domains here. So we've got domain logic, which is talking about adding memberships of users and that kind of thing, right alongside this stuff here, which is very much in the domain of a web application, redirecting to URLs, splashing out notices. And it's all jumbled up together. And those two things might need to change at different rates. So I don't necessarily want to keep them right next to each other. So. What I can do is I can extract out. What I decided to do is extract out the methods that the controller is specializing in. So what does the controller actually do here? The controller does this stuff, and it does this stuff. So I pulled them out into two methods. Can 
that hands-free coding, didn't it? <laughs> and notice how I've named the methods. They're named as though the domain is sending out events about what's happened. I haven't told the controller to redirect to the edit page. I've just sent it a message. Hey, this is what happened. It's up to you what you want to do. Now, of course, this isn't going to fly yet if I want to actually separate out that code in the create action because there's all this coupling going on with an instance variable getting set up there and then used down here. So let's make this a little bit more functional, clean it up. Oh, let's run the tests, yeah. Good map. Run the tests. And what I'm starting to do is I'm, I'm creating a protocol here between the domain and my controller. Okay, so the protocol is that the controller has to respond to these two events. Create organization succeeded, create organization failed. Test still passed, good. So now I've got this code pretty much isolated. I could actually lift this out of the controller action now into another object. And it's tempting to maybe just put it on as like a class method on the organization class, right? Create for current user, blah, blah, blah. I, I think it's a bad idea because basically what I'm doing is I'm giving responsibility to the meta class for organization. I'm giving it a job, but it's kind of hiding in the, in the organization class. So I'd like to actually give this thing a name. What does this thing do? Let's give it a, let's create a, an, an object in itself for that role. So, you know, kingdom of nouns, let's call it a, an, an organization creator. It needs to know about me, the controller, because it's going to talk back to me. And then we can factor out that code into the organization creator. Da, 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 da. We need to clean it up a bit, change the names of the variables. So now my organization creator is told by the controller that we want to create, a, create an organization. And then the organization creator tells the controller, although it doesn't know it's a controller, it just knows it's a listener. Could be anything. Could be a console user interface. Could be an API. It tells it that the create organization succeeded or that it failed and passes it the data it might need to, to use. Notice as well that when we, when we did the instance variable, we didn't even need an instance variable here. We just cleaned that up. So we've got that extracted out in its own object. What if we wanted to change this code now? And maybe we want to start writing to an activity feed when a user's organization gets created as well. So maybe we build this feed writer object that works to the same protocol as the controller's working to. It responds to those two events. So when it, gets, when it hears that the create organization succeeded, it feeds out a message, and then it throws the message on to its listener. And we need to be able to pass on the other message as well, so we need to just delegate that. And now, what we're going to be able to do is plug these two objects together. So in the controller action, we can compose together a bunch of little computer programs that make a big computer program that not just creates a record in the database for the organization, but it now also writes to the user's activity feed. And I haven't had to go and change the little computer program that writes to the organization's table. I haven't had to touch it. I just plug these two objects together. So 
if we just take the code, take, forget about the, the domain code that we, that we extracted out, because obviously we wouldn't keep that in the controller, and just look at what we've got in the controller now. Our action is factoring up some objects on the domain and dispatching them off to work. And it's then offering an interface for the domain to call back to to say what's happened and, res and responding as, as it should to those events. And that's all the controller's doing. There's no more logic in my controller now. So if that business logic changes, it's unlikely that I'm going to need to rerun those slow tests for the controller. I can just run the tests on the core domain. So what we did, we built an organization creator that sat between the, the controller. And effectively, the, the controller, those two uh, event handler methods, that interface, is effectively the controller playing the role of a user interface, right? So the organization control, the creator calls back to the user interface, and then we can plug in other objects. So it reminds me a bit of Unix pipes when I start to get my head around this, the way object-oriented programming is supposed to work, that when we tell other objects to do things, rather than asking them questions and then doing things, ourselves, if we have to tell all the time, we have to pass that responsibility on to another object. So we can't complexify ourselves with the ability to not just decide what other messages need to be sent to objects, but also respond to, to the outcome of those things. We split those responsibilities up into these smaller objects. And we have smaller, simpler tools that we can compose together, just like Unix pipes. I don't know. Tell me about it. I, 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 I'm interested to hear. Actually, I'm not so interested to hear if, if you think these are really bad ideas. I'm, I think this is a bit of a, a problem. If people are exploring things and trying things out, I think we should be enthusiastic and curious about that, whatever it is. This is my two-year-old boy at the top of a mountain in Scotland. He's an explorer. And I think we should all be explorers. I think it's important. So um, thank you for letting me share my explorations with you. And uh, I hope I've inspired some of you to, to do your own explorations and try some of these ideas out. And please, you know, let me know, let me know what you learn. Come on the Objects on Rails mailing list. Tell me what you've learned. So that's it from me, ready to take questions.